Welcome to all of you who are joining us today on both sides of the Atlantic. Our panel discussion today is the third in a series of discussions dedicated to contemporary Ukrainian issues. And it is a part of the Ukrainian Free University's centenary celebration. It has always been and is our role as a university beyond providing education to keep Ukraine in the forefront of European and transatlantic dialogue and to help promote a democratic and an independent Ukraine. When I set out to plan these panel discussions, my aim was to provide listeners with a better understanding of Ukraine, the role it plays in today's international politics and in international security. While the discussions were aimed at a Ukrainian audience with the hope that they could hear a frank discussion about their country, its positive achievements and its shortcomings, what was feasible in terms of their expectations for their European future and what was not. But these panel discussions were also very much aimed at a non-Ukrainian audience living in countries where Ukraine is second or third tier country in terms of relevance and where discussions on Ukraine are often missing. The first panel discussion was dedicated to the topic of Ukraine in Europe with a focus on integration. The second focus on the role of Ukraine in European security, asking the question, Russia first or security first? Both panels consisted of European diplomats, members of the European Parliament, ministers of foreign policy, and members of think tanks. And clearly the perspective was a European one. Today, we examine the place that Ukraine holds in US foreign policy. This discussion follows on the heels of the US decision to allow completion of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, so opposed by many European countries and so detrimental to Ukraine and its East European neighbors, as well as on the heels of President Biden's meeting with President Putin of Russia, which aroused strong concern and criticism both in the US and Ukraine. It also follows on the heels of Secretary of State Antony Blinkland's visit to Ukraine, certainly a gesture of support for Ukraine, but during which he gave far less attention to security issues and more attention to criticizing Ukraine's progress on judiciary reforms and failure to combat corruption factors, he argued, that threaten Ukraine's sovereignty. As two of our former panelists, both of them members of the European Union, of the European Parliament, noted on the subject of corruption, sometimes want to meet ourselves. Alexander Motel, our moderator today, noted in a recent interview with Ukrainian Pravda that it is a bit like telling the Poles in 1939 that the greatest threat to the existence of their state at the time is corruption, but not Germany and not the Soviet Union. And so here we are. Ukraine is preparing to celebrate its 30th anniversary of independence. And we look at the past and at the present of US-Ukraine foreign policy and raise the question, does the US have a Ukraine strategy. For my part, I would add, or is Ukraine a bargaining chip or pawn in US-Russian and US-German relations? These are among some of the questions that our discussants will be addressing today. Our distinguished panelists today include both US and Ukrainian specialists, and permit me to introduce them in alphabetical order. Solomia Bobrovska represents the Holos Party in Ukraine's Verkhovna Rada, and she is the secretary of the Rada's Committee on Foreign Policy. She is also vice head of the Rada's permanent delegation to NATO's Parliamentary Assembly. When Antony Blinkland was appointed U.S. Secretary of State, Ms. Bobrovska expressed hope that he might be the person to help actualize Ukraine's aspiration for a tight Euro-Atlantic integration process. Andrew Harris is Republican member of the House of Representatives from Maryland. He's also the co-chair of the Congressional Ukrainian Caucus 
a bipartisan group whose members share a common concern for building stronger US-Ukraine relations. And as such, in June 2021, he joined in heralding a location of a $100 million package for assistance to Ukraine security to help Ukraine fight Russian aggression. And he also uh, participated in a joint statement on Nord Stream 2, stating that it would undermine Ukraine's security and deepen Ukraine's energy dependence, Europe's energy dependence on Russia. Ambassador Pavlo Klimkin is Ukraine's former Minister of Foreign Affairs, and he's the former ambassador to Germany. And for almost 20 years, he's been in charge of various aspects of European integration, including leading Ukrainian delegations in negotiations on an association agreement and a free visa regime between Ukraine and the EU. On the topic of Antony Blinken's visit to Ukraine, Ambassador Klinkin expressed regret that the visit produced little in terms of security agreements or promises of a defense uh, of defense weapons for Ukraine. Alexander Mereshko is member of the Verkhovna Rada, elected from the Servant of the People Party, and he's the chairperson of the Rada's Committee on Foreign Policy. He is also a well-known expert on international law and human rights, has written extensively on international law implications of Russian policies. And that's vis-a-vis, -vis, of course, uh, Donbass and uh, Crimea. He is also a professor of law and has taught in Ukraine, Poland, and as well, the United States. And William Taylor served as the US ambassador to Ukraine from 2006 to 2009. In June 2019, he was recalled from his position as vice president of the US Institute for Peace and was asked to serve as charge d'affaires in Ukraine, which he did until 2020. It was during that period that he fought to protect security aid to Ukraine. And he argued that assistance to Ukraine was vital for supporting Ukraine against Russian backed forces. Ambassador Taylor has repeatedly promoted active US support for Ukraine. And finally, our moderator today is Alexander Motil, a professor of political science at Rutgers University and at the Ukrainian Free University, where he served as Dean of Social Studies and is currently chairman of the Department on Political Science. As an expert and specialist on Ukraine, Russia, and the former USR, he focuses on topics of nationalism, revolutions, and empires. And he's a frequent contributor to renowned journals and newspapers on topics of Ukraine and Ukraine-Russian relations. Uh, I wish to note uh, uh, to our moderator and to all of you that some of our members are having a bit of a problem joining us today. They will be joining, but I will remove myself to just check uh, what is the problem in their case. So, uh, Professor Moti, the floor is yours. Please unmute, unmute. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Pushlak, and thanks as well to all the participants of the panel, as well as all to the audience for attending. Uh, it's always a pleasure to host these kinds of events and to serve as mod moderator, especially when we have such an, an excellent group of people to comment on this very important question. Uh, let me take the bull by the horns. Uh, the topic is, does the United States have a Ukraine strategy? Um, and of course, when we use the word strategy, we're not just talking about an occasional policy preference, we're talking about a big picture kind of approach, something that relates not just to uh, the temporary interests of the US or Ukraine at any particular point in time, but talks about the relationship in terms of geopolitics, economics, culture, society, and things of that sort. Um, from where I sit, as I look at US policy toward Ukraine, say over the last 10, 15 years, um, I see that the Obama administration wasn't terribly interested. Um, 
then we move on to the Trump administration. It made nice with Moscow, with Putin. At the same time, it was fairly staunch in its opposition to Nord Stream 2 and provided Ukraine with uh, Javelin missiles. And then we move on to the current administration, namely that of Joseph Biden. And initially, it looked like he had both a Russia strategy, a Europe strategy, as well as a Ukraine strategy. It was to bring America back, support American interests, support democracy, support Europe, support Ukraine, and somehow or other keep Russia, if not contained, at least constrained. And then in the last month, everything seems to have become upended. Um, not only do we have the Nord Stream 2 agreement, uh, or at least the agreement between the United States and Germany regarding Nord Stream 2, and we'll talk about that in greater detail. Uh, but what struck me most as an observer was that on the eve of Biden's summit with Vladimir Putin, uh, Biden concedes the, that he will not sanction one of those companies that was involved in building Nord Stream 2, eventually, essentially giving the green light to the construction of the pipeline. Why would anyone do that on the eve of a tough negotiation with an adversary? Why, don't, why doesn't one wait? Why shouldn't have Biden waited a few days and then uh, demanded from Putin a certain kind of quid pro quo for that particular concession. Again, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, anyway, the reason I say this is that I'm not sure that Ukraine, uh, that the United States has a Ukraine strategy. I'm not even sure it has a Ukraine tactic at this point in time. Um, I'm certainly not sure that the Biden administration has a strategy or a tactic. And what worries me perhaps most of all is that it strikes me that the Biden administration is actually proceeding, dare I use the word incompetently, vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine as well as Russia. And in a way that's almost the worst case scenario. Um, a bad strategy is at least a strategy, but an incompetent strategy is, is nothing at all. Uh, so where does, uh, what happened? What happened to the Biden administration? How do they embark on, how do they manage this turnaround, uh, more or less 180 degree turnaround from being essentially pro-Ukrainian and at least reserved in, their, uh, in its approach to Russia, uh, to essentially giving the store away regarding Nord Stream 2, um, while providing Ukraine with the scraps that remain on the table. Um, perhaps we can start uh, with our American guests, since this is a question related to the United States in particular. Uh, Ambassador Taylor, your comments on these issues that I've raised and anything else that you'd like to talk about? Thank you, Professor Modell. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's also my duty. <laughs> or my responsibility to disagree with you on, uh, on some of the things that you just said. And, and if we didn't have some disagreements, why would we be here? You know, this exactly. Is, uh, and so I, 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 in, in that spirit, um, uh, I, I, offer, I offer some comments on, on your comments and on the question, on the, on the question, does the United States have a, a, have a Ukraine strategy? As you've indicated, the uh, Ukraine strategy is not just a is not just an occasional statement. Um, no strategy is just an occasional statement uh, or, or or interest or issue. Um, it is a broader, longer term focused goal. Um, a strategy has to have a goal. Strategy has to have continuity. Strategy has to have resources to accomplish that goal. Um, and I will argue. I do argue. Uh, that uh, the United States does have that strategy. Um, and, and I will come back to what, what the, the, the Biden administration. Um, I'm a little worried about it as well. I'm not a part of any administration at this point. And I will, I will tell you my, uh, my confidence was shaken a little bit by the Nord Stream decision. Uh, but, but, but my overall argument will be um, that the United States does have a strategy and it is long-term and it is backed by resources and it does have a goal. And the goal is um, what uh, 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 Professor Prislak said at the beginning. Um, and, and that is, um, it is 
toward a sovereign, independent Ukraine um, that is that whose territorial integrity is uh, is respected. Um, its borders, internationally uh, recognized borders, respected. Uh, it's sovereign over all of the territory within those internationally recognized borders. And 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 the goal again is for a, an independent, democratic Ukraine integrated into European structures. Um, the the rationale for that uh, for that goal, and I'll come back to the, to the resources part and the, and the longer term uh, geopolitical effort, uh, Professor Modell, that you mentioned. Um, but the rationale for that is that Russia is fighting against Ukraine, yes, uh, but Russia is fighting against a larger issue, a, a larger entity. Russia's fighting against Ukraine, Russia's fighting against Europe, Russia's fighting against the United States. And we see this in, in many different battlefields, if you will. Um, we can take the Amer we Americans, we look at uh, uh, very seriously at election meddling. Um, and the election meddling did not start in the United States, but uh, it ended up in the United States uh, from, from the Russians. I, I was in, in uh, uh, in Ukraine uh, in, in 2014 uh, when the election following President Yanukovych is fleeing to, uh, to Russia. An election took place in, in May. Um, I was election observer down in Kherson. Um, um, I know that the Russians were trying to meddle in the Central Election Commission uh, computers. Uh, the Central Election, Ukrainian Central Election Commission, Commission was able to defend itself. And, uh, and in the end, uh, the Russians were unsuccessful uh, in, in breaching those computers and trying to have an effect, but they clearly tried to have an effect. Um, and they didn't stop there. Um, they tried to meddle in elections in, in Europe. Um, uh, in, in France, in uh, the Brexit uh, referendum. We know uh, there have been many investigations here in the United States about the Russians election meddling in 2016, in our presidential elections in 2016, and uh, the presidential election in 2020. That is, we know that the Russians tried to have an effect on the 2020 election. Um, uh, successful in 2016, unsuccessful in 2020, but they clearly started in Ukraine, then went to Europe, and then came to the United States. We could make the same argument about cyber attacks. And, you know, again, the, the Russians started with cyber attack on uh, Western Ukrainian electoral grid and, and ended up uh, with, uh, not even ended up, or continuing um, cyber attacks on U.S. infrastructure, on oil pipelines, on food distribution, on government agencies, you know, so all to say that the Russians are fighting, yes, they're fighting Ukraine, but they're also fighting Europe and they're fighting the West and they're fighting the United States and Ukraine is on the front line. This gets to my point about the goal and the rationale for the goal. Uh, the goal is an independent democratic Ukraine uh, that is part of Europe and, and we should support it because it's on the front line of this fight uh, with the Russians. Um, let me just say also uh, that that fight, there, there are two battles that Ukraine fight, and this, Anthony Blinken uh, addressed this uh, when he was in Kyiv. Um, uh, and, and I think there are two battles uh, that the Ukrainians are now fighting. Uh, one is against the Russians, as I, as I just mentioned, and the other is against corruption and oligarchs, and corrupt oligarchs, that is. Uh, and uh, they have to win both battles. Um, in my view, the first fight against Mr. Putin is ex existential. Um, and the second fight is important. Uh, the fight against uh, corruption is important. Um, it has been there. It, 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 uh, it is there today and it's gonna be there tomorrow. Uh, and, they, and they need to win both, but, but they're not the same. Um, the first is existential. The second is important um, and, and they have to win. Uh, but there's 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 a difference. Okay, so strategy. Back to strategy. Professor Moore wants to know if there is one, and and I say there is, and I've given the goal, and then but then I have to back it up. Okay, um, first of all, long term. So I've been involved in, in Ukraine strategy, if you will, uh, on the part of the United States um, since uh, you know 1991. Um, uh, I, I was at the U.S. mission to NATO uh, uh, when the Soviet Union disappeared. Um, and that I, that I moved into the State Department and have been working to support Ukraine 
um, since 1991. Um, and the support for Ukraine in the United States, in the Congress, in the executive branches um, has been constant and bipartisan since then. And I'm hoping that Congressman Harris will be on here. I don't see him on the screen here yet, but I'm sure he will be here. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping he will, he will reinforce the, the commitment of the United States, Republicans and Democrats, House, and House of Representatives, Senate of the United States, administrations of Democratic and Republican presidents all the way through. They've had the same goal that I just mentioned. Um, uh, so that's the long term. Uh, I mentioned the rationale, the, the, the strategy needs a rationale, and it is a successful independent Ukraine because Ukraine's on the front line. Last thing is on resources. The United States has provided resources in a range of forms um, from, from diplomatic to political to economic uh, to, sec to security assistance. Um, and and uh, uh, Maria mentioned the security assistance that I was concerned about in the Trump administration. Um, that was just the, 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 the latest, in a, not even the latest. I mean, that was, that was a security package then, and it's continued now. The security assistance has been strong. You're exactly right. The Trump administration did provide uh, uh, lethal assistance, Javelin, anti-tank missiles, um, and the Obama administration didn't. So good on the Trump administration for, for providing that. I'm hoping that the Biden administration, and I'll end with just a comment on the Biden administration, um, will continue that and will provide javelins and, they, um, and other, other weapons and other systems um, that the Ukrainian military needs. Last thing I'll say, Professor Modal, thank you for, for uh, giving me this time, um, is that the, the Biden administration is still forming. It doesn't have all its people in place yet. As you, as my Ukrainian colleagues know, we don't have an ambassador there yet. We haven't had an ambassador there and since President Trump pulled Ambassador Yovanovitch, Yovanovitch out of Kyiv back in what, May of 2019. Um, we've had a couple of charges. Um, current charge, let me just say, current charge, uh, uh, George Kent doing a great job. The, the, the other, the more permanent charge, Christina Kvins doing a great job. Uh, so we've been represented there, uh, but we haven't had an ambassador in two years. Um, and, and we need to have one. And I'm reliably informed uh, that there is an ambassador that has been selected and going through the process and, and uh, will be in, in Kyiv uh, as soon as uh, they can get through the Senate. Um, and, uh, so this, this, will be, this will be coming. So that, that's, number, that's number one. My, my general point here is on the Biden administration. We, they're not yet fully staffed. Uh, they don't yet have an assistant secretary of state for Europe, um, which has responsibility uh, for Ukraine uh, and Russia, uh, I will say. Um, there is an undersecretary of state for policy uh, who th this audience knows well, Toria Newland. Um, she was the assistant, sec the assistant secretary of state um, under President Obama, and she played a very strong role in uh, Ukraine policy and Russia policy. Um, uh, uh, in previous times, and she's playing a strong role now as well, um, and will continue to do that. Um, uh, so, so, so I, I counsel a little bit of patience on uh, jumping to conclusions about the Biden administration. Yet, I disagree with their decision on on Nord Stream. You know, we can we can talk about that, um, uh, but um, I think you know, one can certainly say this about the Biden administration: it is led by President Biden, who knows Ukraine, and he knows Russia. Um, and, and that's very important. Um, so let me, uh, let me stop there. I look forward to uh, your comments, Professor Bodel, and as well as uh, my friend, uh, uh, the former uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs and, and, and the Congressman. I hope the Congressman is on his role. Thank you for having me here. Thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, let's move on to Congressman Harris. I see you in my bottom left-hand corner, so I assume you're actually there. Uh, could you address <laughs> some of the issues raised uh, in the last few minutes? Thank you. Sure. No, I uh, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to be on the panel. I, I am, uh, you know, a co-chair of the Ukraine caucus in the House and uh, sit on the Appropriations Committee. 
Uh, I'm going to say, I, you know, I'm going to be a little more skeptical about the ability of the uh, Biden administration to uh, strongly uh, to exert strong policy in Ukraine. Uh, uh, you know, it's been seven months. It's the seventh month of the Biden administration and no Ukrainian ambassador has been named. If this really was a high priority, you know, why name ambassadors to other countries around the world and yet no Ukraine ambassador has been named? Uh, I am concerned because there are a lot of uh, people who perceive the Biden administration as uh, just a redo of uh, the uh, Obama administration. And we do have to remember that uh, the uh, I, I think one of the uh, signal events with regards to what is going on in Ukraine uh, was the reaction of the United States uh, to the Crimean invasion and then, of course, to the invasion of the eastern oblasts. Uh, with regards to the Crimean invasion, this, this was a clear violation of the Budapest Memorandum. And uh, I was disappointed that, again, uh, the administration took uh, no action, uh, no, no real action against, uh, against uh, Russia, the Russian Federation, for invading uh, the sovereign territory of the, of, the, of the Ukraine, which the United States had guaranteed through the Budapest Memorandum. Uh, this occurred again when the, the, the eastern provinces were invaded. Uh, the, uh, the clear signal uh, should have been sent at that time of lethal aid, of uh, providing lethal aid to the Ukrainians in their defense of their, again, their sovereign territory, which should have been guaranteed under the Budapest Memorandum. So I am uh, not as optimistic as, uh, as to the extent as which the current administration uh, views the uh, views uh, Ukrainian sovereignty and the importance of it vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, our position against Russia. Now, the uh, the Congress and uh, is I think has a much stronger position. Uh, we have uh, we uh, led the fight to actually pr to provide lethal aid uh, and lethal support for the uh, Ukrainians defending uh, their eastern provinces. Uh, we uh, on the Appropriations Committee have, in fact, enhanced aid uh, to Ukraine. Uh, just uh, last week, we actually, uh, in the Appropriations Bill, uh, toughened uh, the the uh, sanctions uh, posture re with regards to Nord Stream by removing the ability to waive sanctions. Which, uh, and I'll agree with the ambassador uh, that that uh, that was a uh, the, the the whole. Uh, the whole policy around Nord Stream 2, and I, and I fault the last administration as well, has been faulty. We, we allowed it to proceed way too far. Uh, you know, look, the gas income uh, through uh, gas transit through Ukraine is a lifeline to Ukraine. It's actually a key to their economic success. And I think any uh, observer would realize that uh, opening the Nord Stream 2 pipeline makes the Ukrainian tr uh, gas transit pipeline uh, essentially uh, worthless. Uh, there is a, a declining gas use in uh, throughout Western Europe, mostly because of uh, the choice to decarbonize the, uh, the energy economy. Uh, so the, the need for an additional pipeline could only be construed as a way for uh, Russia to stop payments to Ukraine for gas transit uh, through the Ukrainian pipelines. Uh, again, I'm very disappointed that uh, we could not stop uh, Nord Stream 2 because I think at this point it'd be very, very difficult to stop. Uh, we also, uh, I do agree that, the, uh, that, uh, that dealing with corruption is an important, uh, an important matter uh, for the Ukrainian government. Uh, you know, President Zelensky, I think, has been slower to deal with it than we would have been led to believe based on promises during the, his campaign. Uh, but again, this is a this corruption is uh, uh, well established in, in Ukraine and may, in fact, be more difficult to root out than than we suspect. Uh, but again, Congress is is uh, very willing to work with our Ukrainian colleagues uh, in the Rada and in, in the uh, Ukrainian government. Uh, to deal with corruption and to eliminate it as uh, quickly as uh, feasible, uh, which I, I think would be, would be a tremendous boost to their economy. Uh, finally, you know, the, 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 one of the last straws, I think, was the administration inviting President Zelensky on August 30th, uh, when the administration knows that Congress is out of session, 
Uh, we, uh, again, we, we had uh, looked forward to an opportunity to uh, meeting uh, with Mr. Zelensky when he was as a Congress, uh, when he made his uh, trip to the United States and we're disappointed. Uh, we're not sure what signal that sends, but the Ukraine caucus sent a letter to the president uh, just yesterday or, to, or may, may be going today, uh, basically asking the president to reschedule that meeting at a time when Congress is in session, which would send, a, I think, a clearer signal uh, to Ukraine and to Russia that, uh, that, that, the, that the Congress of the United States is, uh, is, is willing to stand by our uh, our easternmost ally against our Russian aggression. Uh, with that, uh, again, I would, uh, so, uh, so I view that uh, perhaps the Congress has a, a, a more comprehensive uh, foreign policy toward uh, Ukraine than the administration, but of course, constitutionally, that's not the way it's supposed to be. The administration is supposed to run foreign policy. Uh, I'm afraid that in, the, in, in an effort to appease uh, the Germans, uh, I think that, uh, again, a, a, a fundamental mistake was made with regards to uh, sending a signal that the Nord Stream, to, that it's okay with this administration if the Nord Stream 2 pipeline opens. Uh, with that, uh, again, I will uh, we'll be more than happy to answer questions when it comes to that time. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Harris. I mean, for a wonderful sort of a counterbalance to the views expressed by the ambassador. I mean, there is some overlap and some contrast. Let's now move the discussion to the Ukrainian side, because we've been talking about whether a strategy exists, um, yes or no, and to what degree. Uh, let's see what the Ukrainians have to say. I mean, do they see a strategy as existing? And if it does, is it the right one or the wrong one? And let's start with Ambassador Klimkin. Mr. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Yeah. Uh, good. Good evening. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm. Uh, I'm glad uh, to be able to join uh, Zoom. <coughs> Does not seem uh, to love me today. And you, if you are not in Zoom in current times, you are nowhere. Uh, so uh, it. I, I really appreciate uh, this great opportunity to be among friends. And have a chat uh, about uh, about where we are. So uh, first, uh, let's be at least correct uh, on terminology. Uh, does uh, the U.S. Uh, has uh, have a fundamental interest uh, in Ukraine as a reliable uh, and uh, important partner, and I very much hope as an ally in the future, long term, like Bill uh, has just said, uh, the answer is definitely yes. Uh, does uh, the US uh, have uh, a vision of Ukraine as an ally and is an indispensable part of the transatlantic community, including, but not limiting to uh, becoming the member of, uh, of NATO and EU, my answer is yes. Does the US have a sort of plan? I don't, I would not call it strategy, but a kind of plan, how would you get to it now? especially at the backdrop of uh, new vision and uh, new priorities? My answer is rather no. And uh, just oversimplifying a bit, there are a number of uh, fundamental pillars uh, how the new administration uh, actually sees the world. And these fundamental priorities for me is uh, democracies again, autocracies, China, and climate change. Again, I am oversimplifying. So uh, do we have, uh, and I mean both the US and Ukraine, uh, a sort of common vision, how to incorporate Ukraine in a, in a sequence of new priorities, uh, my answer is rather no, and uh, it's, a, it's a sort of failure on both sides, a sort of asymmetric failure and different failure, but uh, it's, it's here. 
Now the point uh, Bill uh, has mentioned and you, Alexander, has mentioned, uh, although ten ten tangentially, uh, you know, politics uh, does work uh, only personally. Of course, we could have a great vision, strategy, anything, but fundamentally is about respect and trust. Do we have uh, this trust uh, between the Ukrainian uh, system, I would say, not just Ukrainian leadership and the US system, although it's in progress, like Bill has just said? My answer is definitely no. We are not a part of the process in the sense of uh, really trusted conversations. And Nord Stream 2 is bad not only in the sense of impact and results. Nord Stream 2 decision is far more, far more, far more depressing, I would say, in the sense how it had been taken. And we, are, we were not part of this process of so-called decision shaping in a sort of EU slang. And it's fundamentally what worries me. The same on the EU side. So we have two issues to sort out. One is to see how Ukraine should be incorporated in a new set of priorities for the EU strategy. And it's not there. And I do see also uh, not differences, uh, uh, just, uh, and I, I would like, I would love to be, to be really terminologically onto the point here. But it, I, I do see some, uh, some discrepancies uh, among different part of administration regarding Ukraine. I mean, uh, <clears throat> I mean, NSC, uh, State Department, uh, others. So it's not, it's not a sort of different vision, but at least technically, I do see such discrepancies. And uh, uh, so the team uh, around, uh, around uh, President Biden uh, does seem to look onto Ukraine more strategically in the long term which is uh, sometimes not helpful and perceived not helpful back in Ukraine because politics uh, is, uh, is done in, uh, in real time. So what, what, what is the way forward? For me, it would be, it would be a really important, uh, important uh, step to have such common vision or strategy or whatever you call it, because we have Bilateral, uh, bilateral commission on our strategic partnership, which is not, uh, which is not operating for quite a time. Of course, it's rather bureaucratic, but uh, we love bureaucrats uh, somehow. Uh, so we need to come up uh, both uh, at the political level at, at the bureaucratic level with ambitious common vision. I would like to reiterate it, common vision on, it could be three pages, it could be four pages, it could be less, but fundamentally sort of transformative vision of a common, uh, you know, common success for Ukraine. And actually we, we started working on such a vision uh, with, with the Secretary Tillerson. It was uh, our common idea. Some ideas are still there. Some ideas uh, should be should be completely different now, but it's one point uh, we we definitely have to address. Uh, the second point uh, is uh, to make uh, the oncoming visits not just uh, Zelensky visit, but oncoming visits uh, uh, a sort of uh, trigger for at least a uh, good uh, political, uh, political interaction. And it's not there. We need trusted interaction. And uh, I mean, not just Ukraine, but also US. Because I do believe uh, we, can, uh, we can play a far bigger role in the sense of deterring Russia in trying to impact uh, the whole region uh, around us but uh, also strategically in the sense of showing that uh, common success in the case of Ukraine is 
possible and 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 should be possible and uh, and and we are we are not there so uh, fundamentally my answer <clears throat> my answer would be rather negative i do believe the interest in there uh, for Ukraine to become uh, a reliable and uh, and real partner and I hope ally of, of the US uh, in the future, but it's seen rather as a long term future. The region matches uh, this interest, but there is no clear idea how to reach this goal or at the backdrop of uh, of change priorities neither in the US uh, nor in Ukraine. It is a fundamental challenge, firstly for us, both, both of us, and it's an opportunity for Russia, because like Bill said, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, two, uh, you know, two different uh, realities and two parts of the same war. The war against Russia and the war for the future of Ukraine. And it's not a slogan. I, I really mean it. We can't uh, win uh, a war, this war against the Russians without transforming Ukraine. And it should be clearly seen also in Washington. And uh, I, I really don't see if that it's the case uh, now. Uh, let me stop here and uh, I would be ready to engage in our, uh, in our discussion later. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Um... You raised some very important points, and I especially applaud your conceptual clarity. Um, you raised two points, which I'd like to pass on to our two remaining speakers, and then we'll open it up to other questions to the, to the whole group. But I'd like to get some of their perspectives as well. Uh, you raised the point of a, uh, the issue of a common vision or the absence of a common vision, and you attributed that both to failures on the part of the Ukrainian side as well as failures on the part of the American side. And you also spoke about lack of trust. Uh, one may imagine that the inability to come up with a common vision may have something to do with the lack of trust or vice versa, but in any case, those two issues seem to be related in some fashion. I'd like to ask Ms. Bobrovska and then Mr. Mareshko to comment on this issue. Now that, I mean, again, we've identified the need for a common vision and the need for greater trust. Um, and I think we can all agree that those are very important issues. How do we get there? What is this common vision? Who is supposed to develop it? How is it supposed to be developed? In what particular manner? Especially if, as you suggested, there may be insufficient trust on the part of both sides. Um, Ms. Bobrovska. Um. Hi, maybe I'll give the floor to Mr. Marashko. He's the head of the committee, and then I'll continue the, the thought. As you wish. Okay, Mr. Marashko, please. Are you here? Is Mr. Marashko here? I guess not. He has to be somewhere. He was here a while back, but since he's not here at the moment, let's just continue, Ms. Bobrovska, would okay. you? Um, greetings from, from Kiev. Um, thank you for the discussion. Um, the next day after the agreement about the Nord Stream 2 is, is, is rather rather difficult day in, in Kiev, I would say. Uh, we all uh, confused and stressed and yesterday we had the urgent committee where we made the appeal to the Congress to, um, uh, to stop the possibility of actually being um, uh, of, of, the, of the Nord Stream 2. Um, so, I'm not sure that this time is the best time to to speak about strategy. That's more uh, it's that's more about um, the view of our Americans colleague. And I'm very thankful for Mr. Harris. Um, somewhere I I agree with 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 his uh, statements, and um, I see the at least we are looking in 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 one way in one direction. Um, you know, we, we here in Kyiv call this um, agreement, uh, yes, Budapest 96 or Yalta 45. Uh, and we see it like um, as a big, I would say, um, betrayal from the side of our strategic partners from the U US side, um, unfortunately. I think that um, when we're speaking about the strategy on Ukraine, we have to look uh, on um, strategy on all 
US strategy on all Eastern European countries. And I think um, Biden on his becoming president, he was looking for, for um, having and fighting the dialogue or, or um, warming uh, between um, the US and Moscow. Um, and probably um, that, was, that was the price, the Nord Stream 2 was the price um, we had to pay um, for the swarming, maybe. Uh, I don't know what what's, what's the price uh, was from the uh, Moscow side, but still it looks like now it was the big plan and, a stretch, and strategy on Ukraine as well. Um, mm, first of all, um, we have to understand what, what we have to do the next. And um, now what we see in Ukraine, it's not only about the Americans, but about the China issue. And uh, I'm not very, we are not very glad here to, uh, to make again a decision on which, on which way we have to move. Um, but the only, I think the only way we have to, um, Ukrainians have to go and to, to keep, that's the way of um, strengthen, strengthen the state reforms, but the priority has to be to support uh, and to put as a number one issue in Ukraine, that's the support of Ukrainian army. I think that's, that will be the, the, um, the, um, that's, 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 is the, uh, how to say, um, solution for us, um, is just to become stronger but Ukrainian army has to be the has to have the number one priority. Uh, I don't know how to how we will keep discussion and dialogue with the um, American side with the administration. I think that when Zelensky come to Washington, that will be more about the next roadmap of implementing the agreement between Germany and U.S. And we'll see the um, again the points where we um, uh, will be um, again reassuring that uh, no one and Russia as well has um, um, has to break the rules or inter international law but we said we saw the same in 2014 and even uh, at the beginning of, um, of this of uh, 20 years ago when we had the problem with the Tuzla um, and with Putin as well. So uh, I think that's that's a very um, crucial and time for us to understand um, which are new points we have to discuss and to move and to move forward. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Mr. Boroska. You you raised an important issue by shifting the focus to Nord Stream two, and of course. We were going to talk about this, but now is as good a time as any to talk about it in greater detail. Um, you mentioned that it's perceived as a betrayal that, again, the choice of word is very interesting and important because, of course, it reinforces Ambassador Klimkin's point about the lack of trust. Um, if indeed uh, Ukraine's strategic partners have betrayed it, again, <laughs> one might say, uh, then the question of trust really comes to the fore and the question of rebuilding or perhaps building it is of course doubly important. How one attains that is a little unclear to me, something that we might discuss. But for the time being, since you did raise the issue of uh, Nord Stream 2, let's just talk about that. I know both of our American uh, interlocutors have expressed some disappointment uh, let's go a little more into the details of the of the of the agreement, uh, what they do or do not mean for Ukraine, and then of course what Ukraine should or should not do in response. You mentioned build a strong army. Uh, there might be other approaches that would be advisable as well. Um, I'll just read one passage of the agreement that struck me as being especially uh, worrisome well, partly encouraging and possibly worrisome. And that is, uh, the statement reads as follows, should Russia attempt to use energy as a weapon or commit further aggressive acts against Ukraine? That's the, the fact that that is mentioned is good. Germany will take action at the national level. 
I have no idea what that means. And press for effective measures at the European level, including sanctions to limit Russian export capabilities to Europe, blah, blah, blah. And the word that worries me there is press for effective measures. Uh, that sounds like much ado about possibly nothing. Um, not insist, not take, not do, but press. Um, anyway, again, I raise this point simply to reinforce my own unease with the agreement. Um, and as I said at the very beginning in my introductory comments, I'm still befuddled by why President Biden decided to grant Putin this particular concession in advance of their negotiation, as opposed to waiting for after the negotiation or possibly during, assuming that this was indeed something was, that was a fait accompli and had to be done. Um, let's move back to our uh, American interlocutors and we'll start with Ambassador Taylor and then move on to Congressman Harris. Uh, your views on the treaty, the problems, why it came to pass, and now that it's there, excuse me, it's not a treaty, it's, a, it's an agreement, and now that it's actually here in place, um, what is to be done, especially by Ukraine, but more generally by, let's say, let's call it the community of demo democracies that is worried by Gazprom's encroachment on Europe and the West. Ambassador Taylor. Thanks, Professor Morrow. Um, I've expressed my views already uh, in my disappointment with this decision. Um, I think you're asking the right question. Okay, where do we go from here? Um, uh, I think we hold uh, the U.S. government, and in particular the German government, uh, to the commitments that they have made. Uh, you point out, uh, Professor Model, that uh, those commitments in some cases um, are, are nebulous, press for. I mean, what, I, fair point. Uh, what does it mean, press for sanctions? Um, I was just on a call with, uh, with Ambassador Dan Fried, no, well known to many people in, on, on, this, on this call. Um, Ambassador Fried, uh, we, and we were addressing this exact issue, um, uh, Nord Stream and where do we go from here? And, you know, he knows something about sanctions. He, uh, and Professor, uh, Ambassador Fried knows about sanctions um, having engineered the US sanctions and as importantly, the European sanctions um, on, on Ukraine. Uh, first, uh, Congressman Harris, um, on, uh, on Crimea, on the Russian action in the, in the Crimea, and then a broader set of sanctions um, uh, on the Russians uh, for their actions uh, in Donbass, as well as uh, their actions meddling in our elections, as well as uh, other uh, actions that, that they have that the Russians have, have taken there they are the, the, the sanctions um, the economic sanctions both the sanctions on individuals uh, in Moscow as well as on broad sectors of the Russian uh, economy uh, put on uh, by the Obama administration um, after Crimea and Donbass um, uh, have been, and, and I will say also by the Trump administration um, in response to overwhelming support from the Congress. And I go back to this point about uh, the overwhelming support for Ukraine and overwhelming opposition to Russia and, their, and the Russian actions uh, in Ukraine in the Congress. The Congress, and uh, you know, Congressman Harris can talk about this much better than I, obviously, um, but overwhelmingly supported uh, sanctions, the sanctions uh, law um, that President Trump then implemented. Um, couldn't veto, he couldn't veto it. President Trump could not veto it because it's overwhelmingly passed by the House and the Senate. Um, the congressman will know about the House vote in the Senate. It was 98 to, to 2, I think. So there's overwhelming support for these kind of sanctions on the Russians. Um, uh, so, and those hadn't, have had an effect, those sanctions. So, so the question, so, so I'm sorry, so I got diverted. So Dan Fried, who was the, the uh, architect uh, of those sanctions was addressing this issue, Professor Moto, you just asked, where do we go from here? And, and what, is that, uh, what is that commitment uh, by the German government, uh, by uh, Mrs. Merkel on her way out um, uh, 
uh, ha have made to to seek these these sanctions um, if the Russians uh, 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 execute further aggression against against Ukraine. And what Dan said is a long introduction to this punchline. Um, what what Dan Fried said was in his dealings with the German government on sanctions, um, every handshake, every commitment that the German government made, formally or informally, um, on what to do about sanctions on the Russians in response to their aggression against Ukraine was fulfilled. Every commitment was fulfilled. Um, and Dan, again, with a lot of experience, not just on sanctions, but with uh, diplomatic actions, and I'm sure uh, uh, Pablo Clinton knows this um, uh, as well, Dan expressed a strong view that we need to do exactly what I said at the beginning of, of this intervention, that is take what's in that agreement, hold people to it and push forward. Now there, there are some other commitments about funding and a billion dollar fund and 170 down payment and you know uh, other kinds of things. Hold them to it, um, hold them to it, but also hold them to that commitment um, to push for sanctions at the European level that the United States will too, um, if there's more aggression against the against Russians. So hold, hold them to that agreement. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Congressman Harris, your turn. Thank you. Uh, so beyond the agreement, uh, look, look, the leverage that Russia has over Europe is the supply of fossil fuels. That's what it's all about. That's what Nord Stream is all about. That's what the uh, Ukrainian gas transit pipeline is all about. And the United States is in a unique position in the world to reestablish ourselves as the, as the determiner of global fossil fuel prices. The bottom line is that this administration, if they were serious about countering a Russian aggressive stance with regards to using fossil fuel as a leverage point with Europe, we would reestablish our uh, preeminence in the world as a fossil fuel exporter. And that would take certain things we'd have to do. We, we, should, we should go into Europe and aggressively encourage and perhaps subsidize the building of LNG terminals. Uh, we should uh, aggressively explore and produce natural gas in this country in order to, to drive the worldwide price down, which harms the Russian economy almost uniquely in the world. The Russian and a few Mideast economies are uniquely harmed by a low cost of fossil fuels. And we are in the position, we are, we're able to do it. The Trump administration did it. Uh, and, and I would suggest that the long-term solution uh, to the Nord Stream 2 energy leverage that Russia has is for the U.S. to establish, again, preeminence, uh, preeminence in the fossil fuel sector with the, with the specific ability to drive down global prices to harm the Russian economy if they choose to use gas and, or, and, and uh, oil as leverage points with Europe. Uh, we have to remove that, that ability on their part because I'm afraid otherwise, uh, you know, this is uh, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline is, is water over the dam now. Uh, I'm not sure that genie gets back in the bottle, but we certainly can constrain uh, that genie by US energy policy. And unfortunately, the administration, the administration's energy policy is very, I will say, pro-Russian because it raises the price of fossil fuel uh, globally, and it uh, sends a signal that we are not willing to do the exploration and development uh, that needs to be done in order to control the global price of fossil fuel, because uh, it, geopolitically, that's incredibly important. Thank you very much, Mr. Congressman. Um, both of you raise important issues uh, and solutions. Uh, but they're kind of medium long term solutions. Uh, and I suspect many Ukrainians at this point in time are worried about the short term consequences of the agreement that was just signed. And of course, the worst case scenario in everybody's mind, and it's uh, implicit in that long, long historical article written by Putin and or his advisors about a week or two ago, namely that Ukraine is illegitimate, it has no right to exist, that the people don't exist, the nation doesn't exist. And some Ukrainians have interpreted that as essentially a declaration of war. 
kind of the Putin's version of Mein Kampf, something that may seem to have long-term consequences that might in fact be implemented in the short term. Uh, be that as it may, let me now turn to Ambassador Klimkin. Uh, we've heard two responses as to what the United States should do regarding the agreement. What should Ukraine do? Ambassador Klimkin. Doesn't seem to be here. Uh, okay. Yes, well, in that case, Ms. Wabrowska, it's your turn once again. I'm here. I think the so so my point of view is to um, to strengthen by by um, in, inside in, to have the strong to make actually our domestic um, task and act and uh, issues uh, is especially on legislation um, which we have um, which we have to prove uh, on a way to become a NATO, to get a NATO membership. And I think that's that's the way we have to um, we have to speed up uh, and uh, to move to move faster. I know that we have this um, homework still, but uh, on this on uh, on making it, um, I think we'll have to, we have to to ask or to have an appeal to our European countries to support. Um, of getting membership action plan, or um, or to be or to finally become a, a part of the NATO. I think that's 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 be the um, um, the the vice versa. Um, I can say deal, but side uh, which Ukraine uh, can get or can get um, faster than, than we can expect it now. Um, I think that would be the, uh, the that, that compensation. It hasn't be about the money. It has to be about the security, uh, security umbrella, which we have finally to get. And one uh, more point we have to, um, to not to forget, uh, in uh, especially in discussions with uh, with our partners, it's about nothing on Ukraine without Ukraine. We yesterday we heard the um, the statement uh, Ministry uh, of Foreign Affairs Ukrainian uh, statement when they reject that um, the U.S. side and German side had the uh, discussions on a uh, Nord Stream two with the Ukrainian side, and uh, we heard it wasn't so. That's the first and the and the third and the I think the third part is to um, to continue uh, to work on the military uh, military support of um, to uh, to Ukraine. I think that's the three points we have to remember and to work on. Okay, thank you very much. And I see Alexander Marashko has reappeared. Uh, Mr. Marashko, we were just talking about the agreement regarding Nord Stream two. Um, if you would like to address that issue, or more generally, the question of what U.S., what what of what Americans, uh, what America's Ukraine strategy is or should be, and how the uh, how Ukraine should respond to that as well. Your floor, please. Uh, thank you very much, dear colleagues. I'm really happy to see all of you, and uh, to me, it's a great privilege to participate in this important and scientifically and politically interesting event. And I would like just to mention in the beginning that I have read with great interest uh, the interview given by Alexander Matil, and I find it really interesting. I am uh, also a deputy head of the Ukrainian delegation in the trilateral contact group, and I, I read with great interest uh, everything you're writing uh, devoted to this very difficult problem. Uh, regarding, uh, regarding the topic for our discussion today, I would like to make two uh, short and quick points and to ask one question. Uh, regarding these points, um, first of all, I think that we in Ukraine should learn to be more realistic about uh, our place in, in uh, global, uh, global life, in global foreign policy. Another thing that uh, we should proceed from the assumption 
uh, in which I strongly believe uh, that uh, the United States is uh, our true friend and our reliable partner. And we should learn to trust our partner, uh, even though uh, sometimes we don't understand everything what's going on. But I always uh, tell myself in such situations that I don't see the whole picture. And regarding uh, the strategy, uh, I'm not sure whether the United States at present has or doesn't have a strategy or tactics regarding Ukraine and regarding Russia. But if this strategy believe, exists, I don't think that it, sh it should be made public. And I have a question. I'm rereading re uh, now a very interesting book by, uh, written by a famous American neorealist, John Mearsheimer. And he's writing also about and speaking also about strategic priorities. According to him, uh, this, the hierarchy of strategic priorities of the United States has recently changed. And the first place is now held by uh, the relations between the US and China. The second place is Persian Gulf, according to him. And finally, uh, there is a Europe as a, as a third a strategic priority. And my question is about the place of Ukraine uh, in this hierarchy of strategic priorities. Do we have to uh, view relations between uh, the United States and Ukraine uh, through the prism or in the context of relations between, in the triangular, triangle uh, of relations between the United States on the one hand and China and Russia on the other hand? So how we should, uh, approach uh, relations between Ukraine and in the United States uh, in this context. So this is my question to my American colleagues. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Let's let's proceed with that question, um, and it's a very important one. Of course, as you say, it's not, and of course, it's not just of academic interest. I mean, Mearsheimer happens to be a political scientist, uh, but there are many other political scientists, policymakers, policy commentators who of course ask, well, what are indeed the strategic priorities of any country? Uh, and since we're talking about the United States, clearly China, clearly uh, the uh, Middle East and clearly Europe are on that map. I suspect Russia should be up there as well, maybe in fourth place, maybe in first or second, but in any case, it should be up there as well. But however one structures the set of strategic priorities for the United States, it's probably the case that Ukraine isn't in the top four or five. Uh, Ukraine may be ancillary, it may be connected to one of the top priorities. Uh, it may be sixth, seventh, eighth, or ninth, but it doesn't quite seem to have the same clout as China or the Middle East or European Union do, uh, which of course comes back to the point you raised. I mean, Ukrainians have to be realistic uh, they have to understand what their country means strategically to the rest of the world and try to maneuver accordingly. Um, in any case, but the issues are very important. And let me go to Ambassador Taylor. Uh, if you would address the issues raised by Mr. Mareshko and uh, again, more generally, the question of strategic priorities for the United States and of course for Ukraine. Mr. Well, I'd be glad to, and I look forward to Congressman Harris's uh, view on, on these issues as well. Let, let me just say let me, a couple of things um, uh, on, uh, on the Rada member uh, Bobarovska's uh, points. I think she makes a very important point that, um, uh, that NATO membership is important, that security is important, that the strength of the, of the Ukrainian army is important. And I would point out um, that again, thanks to the Congress um, over time, um, in Republican and Democratic administration and, and House, Senate, Republican and Democrats in the Congress, we are the largest supporter and provider of assistant, military assistance, both training and equipment, lethal and non-lethal uh, to the Ukrainian armed forces um, of, of all. Um, uh, they're, they're, and, and the second one is way behind. So we are a strong supporter of, uh, of exactly the, the, the focus um, that, that she points out. Um, and um, we've supported MAP. Um, when I was in Ukraine in 2008, um, President Bush uh, came to Ukraine. By the way, he was the last US president to visit uh, Kyiv as, as president, of course, Vice President Biden was here, but President Bush, last sitting president to visit Kyiv, um, did so on the way 
even I, I was I was there, um, hosted him, um, and he was on the way to uh, Bucharest uh, for a NATO summit. Um, and he came to Ukraine because he wanted to talk to Ukrainians about MAP, about membership action plan in NATO. And he wanted to be able to go to Bucharest and talk to Angela Merkel and then President Hollande about how important it would be to have Ukraine as a member um, to, to get started on the membership action plan. And uh, of course, as, as you point out, uh, Solomia, um, the, the Germans and the French did not agree at that time, but we've continued to support that. We ought to, we ought to uh, do so more, more forcefully now. Uh, we should support in, in terms of uh, pushing hard on NATO membership, I agree. And also, by the way, um, interested in Congressman Harris's view on uh, a major ally. We, the United States can designate Ukraine as a major ally, a uh, major non-NATO ally, because uh, uh, without the Germans and the French, um, you know, we can do that ourselves if the Ukrainians would like to do it. So major non-NATO ally is an option um, that, that ought, to, ought to proceed. Um, on the question about Mearsheimer and uh, uh, Professor Modell, I'm glad you pointed out that there are other thinkers. Uh, prof um, um, John Mearsheimer has, I think, the odd view. I may be, I may be mischaracterizing his, uh, his view, but it's the odd view that some countries, some big countries, have more sovereignty than others countries. Um, and that, uh, that, that some big countries, like Russia, you know, ought to have a sphere of influence uh, because for whatever reason, uh, I, I profoundly disagree with that. I think that there are, uh, the, that nations are sovereign. Um, and that, uh, that sovereignty means respect for borders, um, sovereign means uh, uh, respect for territorial integrity. Um, and, and I'm not sure that Professor uh, Mearsheimer um, uh, ag agrees with that. On the question about priorities on, uh, on, uh, on overall big, uh, Russia, China, Persian Gulf, uh, Europe, um, I have already implicitly uh, uh, expressed myself on that. Um, I, I think the great power competition, U.S., Russia, China, is important, um, uh, and it is probably the primary focus. It certainly was of the Trump administration. I suspect it will be of the Biden administration as well. There's a continuity there on great power competition. Um, certainly, China is the largest challenge um, to the United States over time. Um, I would argue, however, that Russia is the greatest threat um, to the United States and, and our interest uh, now. Um, so Russia is the greatest near-term threat. China is the greatest long-term challenge. Um, and we should deal with it. And where does Ukraine fit? I've already expressed myself on that as well. Ukraine is on the front line of the fight that Russia is waging against the West. It's not just about Ukraine. Um, Russia is fighting against the West and Ukraine's on the front line and as a priority, the United States needs to challenge that because Russia is the greatest threat immediately, as, as, as I've said. And again, I would love to hear the congressman and other, other views of this. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. We have 15 minutes and three speakers. Uh, I'd like to ask, we'll start again with Congressman Harris, move on to Ms. Bobrovska, and then conclude with uh, Ambassador Klimkin. Um, if you would respond to some of the questions raised by Mr. Marashko and some of the comments made by uh, Ambassador Taylor uh, with regard to strategy uh, and Ukraine's place in it. Ambassador, oh, excuse me, uh, Congressman Harris. Certainly. Uh, look, I, I agree with the ambassador. Uh, sending a clear signal on NATO membership would be very important. But again, uh, you know, I don't think we have unanimity of opinion among our NATO allies about the uh, wisdom of extending that membership. Uh, we certainly could uh, uh, claim, the, you know, could designate them as a, as a major ally, major non-NATO ally. Uh, there's no question about that. But we should encourage and uh, use our diplomatic uh, efforts to encourage our European allies to step up to the plate and uh, support uh, so, so with military aid, support the Ukrainians. Uh, again, the, the ambassador is right. We're the, we're the largest supporters, but we shouldn't be. The fact of the matter is, is that uh, the, the entire purpose of NATO for, for really is to counter Russian aggression and the front line of Russian aggression right now runs through the country of Ukraine. So uh, just as the last administration insisted that our NATO allies step up to their 2% commitment, uh, I think it's time for the U.S. to talk to our European allies to step up 
uh, to committing to supporting uh, Ukraine militarily, recognizing that it is, as the ambassador says, the front line of our of our uh, uh, of our of our struggle against uh, the Russian Federation. Now, I, I'm going to disagree a little bit because I, I view China as the uh, greatest global threat, uh, both in the short term and in the long term, economically in the short term, economically and militarily in the long term. And I'm afraid that that might distract a bit uh, as, as we look at how we, uh, uh, how we organize our priorities among where we see difficulties. Uh, I think China is in the long term, again, clearly uh, the greatest threat because, because of their economic position. Uh, Russia, not as much because economically, they're clearly nowhere near the United States or China economically. Uh, yes, they can cause some trouble in Europe, uh, but in the end, uh, globally, uh, they are, I don't think they're viewed as a global threat uh, in many corners of the, of the world. Certainly in Europe they are, but outside of Europe, I'm not sure they are. And, and, and that requires that we exert even more leadership with regards to uh, coalescing our European allies uh, to support Ukraine. Uh, I think they are not doing enough to support Ukraine. I, I think clearly the entire Nord Stream 2 deal with uh, Germany indicates that our European allies are not willing to step up to the plate and put, uh, to some extent, the uh, survival and viability and strength of Ukraine as, as a, uh, as a uh, give it primacy among uh, strategic policy in Europe. Uh, and we, ha we should take leadership on that. I hope we do, uh, because we, again, we have other parts of the world that, that we also have to consider. Uh, but for Europe, uh, the Ukra Ukraine is the front line, and I think our allies uh, should be required to step up. Now, one other thing, one other area, obviously, I think that we can exert more influence and encourage our allies to exert influences in the Black Sea. Uh, clearly, the, the Crimean play by Russia is a play for the Black Sea. And, uh, I, you know, I was encouraged by, again, our British uh, allies in uh, challenging the uh, territorial, uh, the, the territorial integrity of Crimea or the claim of uh, territorial integrity uh, by the Russians. And I think more of that should be done. I, th I think, again, we have to challenge uh, Russia in the Black Sea as well. And with that, uh, thank you again for, uh, for inviting me to participate. Thank you so much, Mr. Congressman. Uh, let's move on to Ms. Wabrowska and then we'll conclude with Ambassador Klimkin. Yes, I just wanted to say to Mr. Ambassador uh, Taylor that uh, um, thanks a lot for the military aid. And I know that uh, since 2014, we've got more than for two billions of dollars of the military help. And um, I know personally um, um, guys, advisors to special operation forces who are working with us. Uh, and they're great and thank you for, for that uh, great job and work. Uh, but sometimes it looks like from here, um, politics and security is in one basket and uh, business in another basket. Uh, maybe it's a high time if, if, we, if we started to talk about trust and I know that you are a great supporter and friend of Ukraine and I know that you understand what I mean when I'm talking about this. Um, we have one day to mix these baskets and to understand that uh, uh, security is, is so connected to, to business that we, we can go out um, with uh, one being with, an, with another uh, basket out. And uh, one point um, Mr. Harris um, uh, mentioned is about Black Sea security. I was during the Black Sea the sea breeze trainings, not for the first time. And I think that uh, it's a high time to raise the question on Azov and um, the sea near Crimea and the Black Sea arena uh, and see more um, to rise, to rise this question. Maybe, um, and the presence of US Navy, uh, even on trainings, that, um, that's a big, um, that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's a good, um, I can say, um, it's not game, but uh, it's a good sign for Russians, uh, especially they, they you probably you know for sure uh, that they are preparing for the big military trainings West 2021 with the Belarus um, armed forces. And Black Sea will be the um, the arena of trainings as well. Um, 
maybe it's a high time to talk about the um, common trainings more than twice or three times um, a year in, in, a, in the Black Sea. Um, I'm done with this. Thank you for the discussion and I'm here up to the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Bogalska, and then Ambassador Klimkin. Um, well, I, uh, unfortunately, I've missed uh, part of discussion because of a problem with communication. Couple, a couple of reactions. Uh, the first one is uh, is NATO. Uh, it's existentially important for Ukraine to become a member of NATO. And I mean, uh, not just critically, but existentially. And uh, I am probably one of the biggest fans of, uh, of that in Ukraine. But uh, a kind of uh, political decision about MAP today uh, would not increase our security tomorrow or after tomorrow. Let's be honest about that. Of course, we can play with this argument and unfortunately is misplayed and misused uh, in uh, many European countries. But uh, we understand that we need uh, different ways of ensuring our security. And for me, it's about bilateral security agreements with the US. It's about uh, placing uh, elements of infrastructure and units on Ukrainian territory, becoming, in fact, not uh, legally part of the eastern flank of NATO, and, of course, uh, different quality of military assistance. Just three points. Uh, security agreement, uh, infrastructure, and military assistance. There is no way uh, out of it. Uh, we, we, we have to play uh, all three. And it's, uh, of course, uh, the NATO story should go in parallel. But again, uh, it's the story for mid run and long run. It's not a story for today or, or tomorrow. <clears throat> The point on Nord Stream, the tragedy of uh, Nord Stream is not just about uh, the future and results. Uh, the problem, the fundamental problem for Ukraine, but I believe also for the United States, is that uh, Ukraine is not in play at all. We were not playing any active role, and I mean any active role in the process. And we, are not, uh, we were not part of the process, and we are not the part of the solution. And of course, it's important that effective functioning of the Ukraine gas strategy system is a red line. But fundamentally, all the discussions uh, will have to happen, as I see it also, uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, with uh, engagement of Ukraine. Uh, but uh, I would say on a kind of, uh, in a kind of Zoom mode remotely and uh, it's not <clears throat> it's 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 not a way forward so fundamentally the way how we talk to our strategic partners especially if the us should be changed now it, it's again about uh, respect and trust it's about uh, people to people contacts uh, it's becoming again a reliable and predictable partner and it's not a kind of uh, line in any kind of political declaration and on Europe uh, and Germany, I believe our approach to Germany and to many European countries, but uh, especially to Germany is fundamentally wrong now. It should be, uh, it should be let's say, uh, adjusted, adjusted in a, in, a very, in a very comprehensive way. We need to uh, treat Germany and we need to engage engage Germany. It's, uh, there will be a kind of different Germany, not Merkel's Germany in a couple of months from now. And we have still uh, no answer to this challenge, at least uh, how I feel it. But on the top of that, uh, I, I really believe uh, that the common success on transforming Ukraine uh, in an ally not just in a strategic partner. What does it mean strategic partner? We can basically reframe it in any way, but an ally 
it's like for for musketeers, you know, one for all and uh, all for one. It's exactly the meaning of uh, of that uh, of that for me. Whether the U.S. is ready now and have a vision for that. I believe no, but whether there is a necessity to find out uh, the sense of this vision and the way forward is, uh, is definitely yes. So uh, just to be as short as possible uh, for it up and leaving you, Alexander, a couple of minutes, uh, you know, to, uh, to wrap up the whole discussion. So thanks again, it was good to see all of you, unfortunately still on Zoom, but uh, anyway, it's the only opportunity. Let's, uh, let's hope for another opportunity in the, in the nearest future. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, let me just sort of provide a very brief resume of some of the points I think that are worth keeping in mind. Uh, one is that the United States does indeed appear to have a strategy, uh, long term, centered on Ukraine as being an independent, democratic, sovereign state. Uh, where there seems to be greater uncertainty is with regard to the question of tactics. Um, what does the United States, what should the United States be doing at any particular point in time in order to reach that strategic goal? Um, and there, again, Ukrainians have different views. They also disagree amongst one another. Americans have different views. And of course, Europeans have even more different views. So getting from point A to point B seems to be, as always in politics, the key problem. Uh, the vision is clear. The goal seems clear. Everybody can agree on the niceties. But the actual practical steps, they begin to raise all sorts of complex issues. Um, but of course, in addressing these complex issues and in coming up with something resembling either a map or a, I don't mean map in the NATO sense, but just a roadmap or a common vision, uh, clearly what seems to be absolutely necessary is that there be continued and indeed intensified dialogue between Ukrainians and Americans. And of course, Europeans and everybody else, but at least in terms of this particular webinar, it's those two groups that need to be talking to each other at all levels. The levels that we've addressed today primarily focus on policymakers. Those, of course, are critically important, but they would also extend to business people, think tanks, and everybody else. Um, and then perhaps by some kind of process of osmosis or Brownian motion, if you prefer, something resembling a coherent vision, uh, which would be more than just a set of diplomatic niceties, but which would actually outline strategic guidelines uh, or tactical guidelines by means of which a particular strategy could be reached, could in fact be achieved. Um, let me end on that. Uh, let me just make one final suggestion, perhaps to the Ukrainian Free University or anybody else who's listening. Uh, Ms. Bobrovska raised the issue of the Black Sea. Um, and that, of course, as all of you know, is strategically important, geopolitically important, economically, and for all sorts of other reasons. And that may indeed be worth a separate seminar of its own, uh, either in this forum or some other forum. Um, of course, I'm not being original in suggesting this because people have indeed pursued these kinds of conversations. In any case, let me thank all of you, all participants, for your excellent commentary, for your sobering and sober analyses, um, for your good humor as well. Uh, let me thank uh, the rector of the Ukrainian Free University, Dr. Prushak, for organizing this excellent presentation. And then, of course, last but not least, the many participants, uh, I trust and hope you learned as much as I did. And I learned a lot. So thank you all very much and be well. Thank you. Over and out. Participated. We wanted a frank discussion. We received it. Indeed, thank you also, uh, Professor Motte, for guiding this discussion so well. And uh, this ends our arc of uh, panel discussions for this period. We will be beginning again in fall. And indeed, not by chance, we are looking at the Black Sea. So uh, until we meet again, hopefully in fall, I wish all of you a good uh, summer. 
and invite you to join us again for our fall uh, series, our fall arc of, of panel discussions. Goodbye to everyone.